Hello, welcome to another exciting video on the Matt Classics YouTube channel. The other day, I finished reading this delightful book, Boethius, The Consolation of Philosophy. This is the fourth time I've read it, and the second time I've read it in 2022. The first time that I read it this year was, in fact, in a modern English translation of the old English translation out of the Latin that was associated with the great cultural renaissance project of King Alfred the Great. And the reason I'm reading it right now is actually to because I'm going to be giving a paper um, at a symposium online about Tolkien among the theologians. And I'm very excited about that and the Boethian themes that run through the Lord of the Rings. But I'm not here to talk about that. No spoilers. Um, I am talking about power, though. Uh, instead, I was just reading it because the other thing that's going on in my life right now, something that is not about Tolkien or about fantasy is that I am teaching, as my recent videos have pointed out to you, I am teaching for the Davenant Institute a course on the Desert Fathers. And last night, for example, we read, I finished my lecture on the life of Antony. Here I am holding up the translation by Tim Vivian and Apostolos and Athanasakis for Cistercian Publications. Shout out to Cistercian, who's one of my favorite publishers. If I had the money and the space, I would own everything they had ever published. But I don't, so I don't. So, um, and what I realized this time through Boethius, you get something different from books like this, whether it's Boethius's Consolation of Philosophy, The Life of St. Antony, The City of God by St. Augustine, or The Confessions of St. Augustine, or The Lord of the Rings, or The Hobbit, or The Aeneid, or The Iliad, these great works of literature, whether it's philosophy or theology, or the life of a saint, or a novel, or a poem, um, like, how many times can you reread John Donne, Batter My Heart, Three Person to God, right? These things resonate you with you in different ways. You pick up different things with each reading, which is why I love rereading books. I'm sort of entering a sort of deep rereading phase in my life, not just because I'm rereading things I read as a student in order to teach them now, but also because I just... I'm re rediscovering things that I love. So I'm on round five through The Hobbit right now. And why not? Right? So, so right now, this round through Boethius, because the Desert Fathers were very much at the forefront of my mind. I am in, also in the middle of a writing project about Evagrius of Pontus. And I'm reading the sayings of the Desert Fathers, the life of Antony, continually thinking about um, these amazing stories about the Desert Fathers and trying to cast everything for this course I'm in the midst of teaching. And so I'm reading Boethius and I realized, and this is probably no shocker to anyone, but at least no one who sort of thinks about the history of Western thought, but I realized that Boethius isn't just Aristotelian philosophy cast in a mode that a Christian can palate, shall we say. Here, the consolation of philosophy isn't just philosophy. It's not just early medieval Aristotelianism or Platonism, um, depending on how you define Platonism. It's not just things that you think about. And it's not just helpful to you when you're going through a rough time, which is sort of what I've seen before. Now, this round through it, when I'm in the midst of a season of my life, when I am reading the Church Fathers a lot, um... And I've just finished teaching this course on Athanasius and coming up to teaching another course on the 4th century in January. And I'm in the middle of the Desert Fathers. Realizing how, how much a part of that world Boethius is and how many of the th truths that he has in there, although he, it is all done sort of through reason and reasoning about experience, um, everything that he does in there, even I would say even he includes a, a number of Greek myths, even those themselves, I would say, end up resonating with the Christian scriptures and with the Christian tradition. Um, for example, he I, I love it. I'm there for this. Orpheus and Eurydice cast as an allegory of a, the mind's ascent to God in, in contemplation, as we would call it, um, in the Christian mystical tradition. I'm there for that. And the way he reads the text, why not? Like, you can make a Christian allegory out of a pagan myth. Uh, pagans made pagan allegories out of them. So this is the thing Boethius is doing. And one of the things that he is casting here, actually, I would argue, is the foundations, the philosophical foundations for the monastic 
and contemplative life. Now, I say that, and then I hasten very quickly to say that a lot of monks, of course, have no such need or background, right? Um, a lot of monks are illiterate when they join the monastery. They just feel this call. A lot of other monks, just a lot of other people don't need to work through the philosophy of things to be able to become a monk. You don't, you don't need this, but I think a lot of people would. I would imagine that someone like Arsenios, um, Abba Arsenios, who was a senatorial aristocrat, um, or Vagris of Pontus, who was a highly educated um, sort of Greek Hellenistic figure from Pontus before he came to the Desert Fathers. Perhaps this kind of philosophy would be especially helpful for them, because for them, what they're leaving behind is the sort of life that Boethius led till he was cast into prison, right? Boethius, if you don't know him, Boethius was um, a man of senatorial rank in late antique or early medieval Italy. He was uh, he worked at the court of the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great, Theodoric the Amal, um, and this is sort of the first barbarian kingdom to rule in Italy. And there's sort of a we might say constitutional fiction that the Gothic kingdom of Theodoric is itself actually still part of the Roman Empire and that he is ruling at the behest of the emperor in Constantinople. There is no longer an emperor in the West. And uh, Boethius there, and he and he marries into a super high aristocratic family of the Symmachi. And if you look at late antique stuff, find people named Symmachus, they're, they're there doing stuff in the Senate, in the Curia, right up to the last and beyond, I suppose. And so he moves in, into this, and he's a big philosopher, though, right? He's translating um, Greek philosophy into Latin. He's writing his own works of philosophy um, based on those. He's also getting involved in the Christological debates, which I think is really important to think about as well. Um, and he has some really good things to say there where he puts um, philosophy at the service of theology, because philosophy is theology's handmaid. And uh, so, yeah, he does all sorts of great things, but he ends up being accused of subverting the ruling regime, that he ends up being accused that his support of Senate and senators um, is actually part of a plan to undermine the power of Theodoric. And so he finds himself thrown in jail and dies. And some claim he dies a martyr because he dies at the hands of a heretic. But he dies for politics, not religion. He is killed for politics and not religion. So neither his death nor the killing of him was done on religious grounds, although it is to be pointed out that Theodoric does become more suspicious of his Catholic subjects in the years following the accession of Justin um, the first, the East Roman Emperor. But anyway, the only Roman Emperor, actually, and Gen Justinian. So, but Justinian's after Theodoric anyway. But anyway, that sort of era of Justinian is sort of there with his uncle Justin, if you know sort of Constantinopolitan politics at the time. So, um... So that's sort of the context. And so while Boethius is in prison, he uh, is moaning, as one would be expected to do. Oh, woe is me. I was a good man. I lived a good life. I studied philosophy, and I promoted philosophy and the good life, and right thinking, and wisdom, and, and all of these things. And yet, and yet here is where fortune has cast me down to the ground. I don't deserve this. It's not fair. Why do good, bad things happen to good people? Why do good things happen to bad people? It sucks. Everything is terrible. This is Boethius. And then he has this vision of philosophy. You can see her here on the front cover. I'm standing there. And she uh, comes and she talks to him in jail. My three-year-old son interpreted the cover of the Penguin Classic correctly. He said, who's this? I said, oh, that's that's the figure of philosophy. And he says, who's that? And I said, oh, this is the man who wrote the book. His name is Boethius. And he said, why is he in jail, daddy? So then I explained to him why Boethius is in jail. And while he's in jail, he has this visit from philosophy. And he writes down this dialogue that he has with her philosophy herself and he does it sort of in the literary form of a menopean satire um this so literarily not in tone similar to seneca's apocolocentosis but anyway i'm apparently not doing latin literature on this youtube channel i'm doing the history of christianity and the history of christian thought and particularly i would say i want to focus on things to do with monks and spirituality and that sort of thing. And Boethius, look at all the tabs I have for my research for this paper I'm going to be giving in a couple weeks. Not all of those are for that. Some of those are just for me and my own heart and my own soul. Because, you know, I've been going through a bit of a rough time anyway, too. Lots of people do. And so part of the question then is, well, what is a good life? 
what is happiness? This is part of what goes on in the dialogue. And how do you achieve happiness? And what is truly good? What actually is good? What is the good? What is real power? What is evil? Does evil actually have any power whatsoever? Um, and all these sorts of things. And then, basically, we get to some important points that happiness is possessing, and in, in, I would say, this is my own sort of recasting, paraphrasing of Boethius, so it may not be Boethian language, but I hope that if you know Boethius, you would agree with what I'm saying. That happiness is a state of imperturbability, we might say, um, where you are, um, you are, aren't worried about, it doesn't, that comes from within. It's imperturbability that comes, well, if not from within, certainly not from the external circumstances of your life. Um, and the only person who is perfectly happy is God. And God is also, because God is perfectly good, right? If you are, if your greatest good is the good, tal kalan, um, the summum bonum being God, the greatest good, the highest good, if this is what your chief delight in life is, then, you know, take, take my love, take my land, take me where I cannot stand. Um, just take it all. You still have the good. You still have philosophy itself, even if you don't have access to any of your philosophy books. They can take, they can take away the penguin history of the world. Can I get my finger to move in the right direction? They can take it away from me, but I will still have... Um, residing in my soul, deep philosophy, um, if I truly pursue the good, the true, and the beautiful, which is the point of Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy, is the pursuit of those things. And uh, But the, the, it is determined that the person who is, has the greatest happiness, felicitas, I believe, in the Latin, is ultimately God. Um, because he and God exists in eternity, which means he exists outside of time. Everything to God is a perpetual now, which is really cool, and I love thinking about time. Um, this and St. Augustine, oh, good fun. Good fun to be had thinking about time with um, late antique and early medieval Christians. But so, and how do you get, and so then that means that to, to the degree to which you are in possession of the good, you yourself are participating in the divine life. Um, and let me tell you, around this time, the Greek fathers have come up with a word for that participation in the divine life, and that word is theosis. Their other word, about 200 years before, was theopoiesis. I guess they decided that was too many syllables. That we share in the divine life and we become basically like mini-gods inasmuch as we are having union with God through our pursuit of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And that God himself, of course, being pure being, and being itself, we might even say, when we pursue him and we move further up towards him, that is when we become most truly ourselves, most truly true, and therefore most happy, finding this imperturbable calm. And the, all these other things that we think are good, power, glory, wealth, all these things, health, he doesn't talk about health, but that would be one, Right. Um, what's the line in Godfather Part 2? If you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Um, all of these things are seen to be secondary and that if you're grasping onto God, then that is really where true happiness lies. And then whatever other f things that fortune might do to you, because it doesn't matter, right? Because Boethius has this famous image of the Wheel of Fortune where Pat Sajak comes out and he grab into the middle of the story, he comes the third person in the dialogue, and he grabs this huge wheel and he spins it around. This is not actually true. So, which is the idea that Fortune's wheel has a top and a bottom, and you could be at the top, you could be like a king, but Fortune don't care, huh, like a honey badger. And so, the wheel can turn and you can find yourself on the bottom getting crushed by Fortune's wheel, right? All of these good things can be taken away from you in an instant. I'm emperor of Rome. Not anymore, if you look at East Roman politics of the late 400s. Um, I'm, that's not an example he gives, but that's a good one, right? And so then, but what really matters is, or I'm a companion of the emperor. Well, that's great. Look how that worked out for Seneca. But the degree to which Seneca had fulfilled his philosophic goal, this is an example that Boethius uses, the degree to which Seneca had fulfilled his philosophic goal 
which is to live according to his own nature, the nature he was created with, um, and to pursue the good, to truly pursue um, virtus arete, Latin Greek virtue, um, if you can unpack what virtue is properly today. To that degree, he is free from the vicissitudes of fortune. And it doesn't matter if Nero comes and forces him to commit suicide. Now, a Christian wouldn't actually go through the suicide. A Christian would go through a martyrdom instead. Right? Boethius isn't going to open up his veins in a bathtub. So, this is what the truly good life is. And so, reading about that, there's lots more. You could go on and on. And that is not a straightforward explanation of the order of events within the dialogue. It actually does move through, um, I would say, actually pretty good progression. I do recommend it. Um... I know someone who read it in a day. You could easily read it in a day if you don't have two small children of whom you are the primary caregiver. So I recommend Boethius's Consolation to you very highly. But how does it tie into these guys? Well, the answer is, this is what they're seeking, right? They are themselves seeking participation with God in the divine life. Um, I don't know that they often use talk about felicitas or eudaimonia, um, happiness, as much as Boethius does. But they do know that your arete, your virtus, is the only thing that you actually possess that cannot be taken away from you by um, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. So, and they say, well, therefore, if my wealth can be stolen by robbers... If my health can be taken by disease, if my family can be slain by brigands, if even my very life can be taken by disease, by brigands, by robbers, by the emperor himself, by the dangerous sea, if all of these things can be lost, and the only thing, when therefore I come and stand before the dread judgment seat of Christ, the only thing that I can hold on to is the degree to which, by his grace, which is deeply embedded into um, monastic literature from the get-go, as well as in the works of St. Athanasius. By his grace, stand before him, all I have to hold on to is my achievement of the good, the degree to which I participated in the good, the true, and the beautiful, and the greatest of which, the tr most true of which, is found in God himself. Then I'd better be pursuing that. And so what do I do to pursue God? What is necessary for me if I desire am desiring God? What is necessary for, for me if I wish to participate in the divine life? What does theosis look like? What does it look like? Boethius also talks about how we move from lower to higher as part of this pursuit um, into contemplation, theoria. Um, this is a big deal in um, ancient pagan philosophy. It is a big deal in ancient Christian asceticism and mysticism and um, continues to be so forever if you truly grasp what it's about. And so Boethius talks about this, and so do the monks. Um, they don't actually talk about their own personal experiences that much the way St. Augustine does, but they do talk about um, you need to just sit down. Um, Antony says you need to go to bed with the Psalms on your lips and wake up with the Psalms on your lips. You need to spend your day at prayer. You need to spend your day in the scriptures. You need to be seeking God. Um, and you need to have um, your spirit pursuing, um, going higher into noetic things. And this sort of gets more articulated in different ways, but flowing from Athanasius and the Desert Fathers to people like Evagrius of Pontus, and then with some, uh, I don't know, some really great high points in Maximus the Confessor. Um, who I think takes some of the best of the Athanasian legacy and the desert legacy and um, unites them together, St. Maximus does, in the 600s. So he's like 150 years after Boethius here, maybe not 150, 125. Um, if you think about that, um, this beautiful thing that we do write, we set our minds on things above um, and we try to clear our minds of everything else so we can focus just on God in Christ and our participation in him comes through this and also of course it comes through virtuous action as well and we have watchfulness over our thoughts to help us clear and focus our minds on God who has revealed himself to us in Christ Jesus about whom we learn in the scriptures and so this is what the monastic life is actually about it's not about 
beating yourself up. It's not about the mortification of the flesh, flesh as an end of itself. A quote, I don't know if I've used it on this YouTube channel before. I've used it on my blog a couple times. Kalistos Ware um, quotes this paraphrase of Sergei Bulgakov in his book, The Orthodox Way, that we discipline the flesh in order that we may gain a body. And that is what, which means the body at the resurrection. So when the monk comes and stands before the dread judgment seat of Christ, he has been being conformed into Christ through theosis, through his participation in the divine life, through his union with God, achieved through the grace of God at baptism, achieved through the grace of God at prayer, achieved through the grace of God reading the scripture, achieved through the grace of God in the Eucharist. The Desert Fathers had priests amongst them. They received the Eucharist. This is what the monastic tradition is about. And the philosophical foundations for this are laid out in Boethius about um, what is true happiness, how, what is contemplation, what is participation in the divine life. These things are all there, which I think is super cool. So you should read Boethius. You should read St. Athanasius's Life of St. Antony. Um, these are foundational works. Whether you're a Christian or not, I'm pretty sure that like anyone who watches my videos as far as a Christian, why would you put up with me longer? Um, if you're a Christian or not, if you're interested in the Western tradition of spirituality and thought, both of these texts are immensely influential throughout the entire Middle Ages and are still read to this day. Um, so you should read them. Um, and you will sort of, I hope, you can sort of see how the thought, the work of thought put out by Boethius on the one hand, um, manifests itself and flowers forth in the lives of the Desert Fathers. That's all I have to say to you today. God bless and... I'll see you again soon.